I love that I am who you say I am. I am not who I think I am. I am not who others say I should be, but I am who you say I am. Just that powerful truth and recognizing and understanding our identity being in Christ and who we are in Christ and that we are righteous in Christ and all these wonderful things. Uh, I, I just, I love the words of that song. So there was a little bit of internal turmoil for me. I got to share this with you because somebody gave me some bad information, I think. Uh, and it really messed with me for a little bit. And then I Googled it and then I got all figured out because Google fixes everything. So in, in your emojis, so you know the, the, the praying hands thing that you send to people? All right, so now somebody tried to tell me the other day that that was a high five. Now think about this for a minute, okay? When you think about the communication of texting, when somebody texts me and says, look, I really need you to be praying for me right now. You know, I've really had something going on and, and just can you, can you be looking out for me? And my response is, you know, absolutely, prayer hands. But if that was true, it'd be like absolutely high five, right? You think about the disconnect in communication and how kind of disrespectful that would be. Or if, you know, they'd be like, we're really going through a hard time. You know, man, you know, I'm so sorry. High five. And then people are just like, yeah, not so much. But you think about when you look at the idea of, of emojis, you look at communication. And the reality is it's actually, if what Google is right, it said that, you know, it's like, you know, in Japanese culture, in Asian cultures, you know, this kind of means please or thank you. And, and it's also been translated also for prayer. So it is not a high five. So you can continue to pray for people using the emoji of this uh, and you're okay. But sometimes if imagine if somebody did believe that was a high five and they asked me to pray for them and I wanted to give them a high five instead. There'd be a little bit of a, probably maybe a frustration and, and a failure in communication. And the reason why I wanted to start just kind of sharing that and making light of it is because a lot of times we think about people that we have bad relationships with, or we think about people that may be identified as enemies or hard to love or hard to communicate with. So many times, a lot of the disconnects in our relationships is miscommunication and, and bad perceptions. And a lot of it not necessarily has to do with just being purely evil. It has to do with just us poorly communicating with one another, has to do with uh, perceiving things from one another, misreading certain things or, or missing cues or assuming things into something. I don't know if I've shared this with you before, but so I'm kind of a worrier. And just this is as your path. I worry when I don't have anything to worry about. That's where I go sometimes. And so when I worry about different things, what that's a heightened sense of incommunication. If somebody says something, I'll be like, what do they mean by that? Did, 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 they, did they say that because they don't like me? Or, or did they say that? And is that, is that their way of saying that, that they just, they hate what we're doing? Or, or does that mean that they said that because, you know, maybe they just said that because that's what they said. Quit worrying about it. Quit thinking about it. Quit overanalyzing certain things. Quit or imposing what you think upon somebody else and what they mean. And so we need to be very careful when it comes to communication in ourselves and how we project onto others and we assume what they are doing to us. And I think that that's something for us that, that we'll talk about today when it talks about loving our enemies and as far as communication and this whole idea of sometimes that communication is very hard. Um, and, and we'll look at that a little bit, but more importantly, how for us, things that we do as far as our relationships and loving our enemies or loving when it's hard is something that's going to take effort for us and when it comes to being a part of the body of Christ. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, but um, before we get there, I wanted to, to kind of build on this idea uh, of thinking about our enemies and who they are. Or thinking about even though sometimes loving our enemies or loving when it's hard because we will love people and sometimes it's hard to love people even when they're not necessarily classified as enemies. Sometimes we have people and you know those people that you love and it's like when you want to love them and hug them, it's like hugging a porcupine. It's a little prickly and it hurts a little bit. They got, they're a little grumpy. They got some issues going on. But you know what? You try to love them, but it, it's a little hard. It's sensitive. Maybe you're walking on eggshells and different things like that. So they may not necessarily be enemies, but it's still hard to love them. And maybe you're the prickly porcupine in the relationship, right? That can happen. You know, maybe you're the grumpy teenager in your home and your mom and dad are like, I don't know what to do with you. Or maybe when it comes to your spouse or being a child or whatnot. But either way, in our relationships, we can look at enemies and we can easy, easily justify, well, they are bad 
and they get what they deserve. I'm not that way. I'm not an enemy. I'm a good person. I'm living and doing things the right way. You know, we can justify our behaviors and our actions and how we treat other people based upon, based upon our own perceptions and how we see ourselves and how we see the world. But think about this for a minute. Romans chapter five. This is where God positions us from the beginning. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified, how? By his blood, not by your works, not by your actions, not by your deeds, not by anything you say or you do. You are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Not only as a sinner were you saved by grace through faith, but not only were you justified by his blood, you were also shielded and protected from the wrath of God that Jesus took that cup in your place for you so that you would not have to endure the wrath of God and being shielded from that. But then this verse, for if while we were what? Enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Guys, think about this. When we think about loving our enemies, we think about loving people who are hard to love. That is putting a picture of the gospel before other people. And when, before we can think about the fact that people get what they deserve, we must recognize and understand that that statement is not anywhere a part of the gospel message. That we were once enemies of God, but yet we were reconciled to God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That we were taken from death into life. We were taken from enemies to now children, heirs of Christ the radical transformation that the gospel brings to our relationship from being enemies and separated from God to now being united in Jesus Christ. So when we think about this idea of loving our enemies, we are making him known through how we can love people in our community who may be hard to love or how we can love people in our family who are hard to love, how we can go to work and love people who are hard to love. What we are doing is making the gospel known to these people in hopes that reconciliation can take place in their life as they can be drawn to Christ, saved by his blood, brought into the kingdom of God and become brothers and sisters in Christ with us. Guys, this is more than just getting along. This is kingdom building when it comes to loving our enemies and loving people when it's hard because we were once enemies of God. But yet the only reason why we are where we are is by the mercy and the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And so let's go into Luke chapter six as we look at this understanding and notion of loving your enemies as Jesus is teaching here. But he says in this, in verse 27 of chapter six, but I say to you who hear. Now that's really important for us to understand because who's he talking to? When he says, but I say to you who hear. So we know that from Romans, that it talks about faith comes from what? Faith comes from hearing. And hearing comes from what? We hear from what? The word of God. So when he's talking, I say to you who hear. He is speaking to believers. He is challenging those who have heard him, received his message, believe in Christ, living for him, believe that he is the Messiah and are following his ways. This message is to believers. Guys, it's very easy to look at the world and say, there is a different metrics. There is a different standard from relationships, from what the world presents and then what we, we present. And there's a fine tension that goes on between those two relationships. So when we're reading here, he is speaking to believers. This is nonsense to the world because the world wants to, as we will see, wants to love in a way that's reciprocal, wants to retaliate, wants to make, make good investments, but don't be stupid about things. But yet, but what Jesus is saying is that we are to love radically different than the world. 
So he's speaking to believers. So as we come together as the body of Christ, as believers here, for those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ, here's our message on how we're to love our enemies. So he says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Okay, and we all hear that. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so how? He says, do good to those who hate you. So think about that. Those that hate you. Now, that's a harsh term, right? But there are people in our lives who hate us. Believe it or not, whether you think that you are great and you can skip down the primrose path, there is somebody that you have crossed or there is somebody you've disappointed. There is somebody you have upset. You are on somebody's enemy list or naughty list. You just are. And you, some of them you may not even know. But there are people that hate you. But even Jesus says, look, the, the world's going to hate you, but it hated me first. Even as a Christian declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ, putting your faith and trust in him, people are going to hate you for that. And so you think about, so, but we are to do good to those who hate, hate us. How does that look? So when somebody hates you, when somebody's gossiping about you behind your back, speaking ill will of you, and what is your typical response needs to be? is to do good to them, to love them anyway. Unconditionally, you know, regardless of how they are behaving, you are to love those who hate you. Verse 28, bless those who curse you. So now look, we live in a culture and a time here where we're, we're, there's people not going home with voodoo dolls and, and doing incantations and curses and hoping that, you know, you trip and fall in a mud puddle or that bad things happen to you. But there are people that are around you that are hoping that you fail. There are people at the work, at your job where you work, they want you to fail so that they can get your job. Or they want you to slip up so that they can get the promotion before you. There are people that, hoping, that are hoping that you fail to make them feel better about themselves. There are people, so, but we are called to bless those who curse us. You may want me to fail, but I want to see you succeed. Think about how radical that is when it comes to those people in your life that you know that wish ill will upon you and what you do in return is you bless them. You love them anyway. It's just, it goes against every fiber in my being to do that. But that is what the gospel challenges us to do. And he says, pray for those who abuse you. Now look, man, I, my view on that statement is really a view from the cheap seats. I've never experienced abuse. Now abuse is not, not only physically, but it is also mental. Abuse from words can, be, can hurt you more than a fist or a back of a hand. But to be challenged by God to pray for those who abuse you, I can't even imagine having to, to read that and come to terms with that and obey that if I've experienced abuse. But you have to think about the radical nature by which we are called to love. And then verse 29, he says, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic too. Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. And we'll continue to read and then we'll go back through. But then he says, verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies, do good, lend, expect nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. Now, I don't know about you, but this passage of scripture just makes me feel uncomfortable. 
because it is calling me to do something that in my emotions, in my flesh, in my feelings, it is completely counter to what my initial response is. It is abs- when somebody says something to offend you, what is your immediate response? Say something right back, right? You're ugly. I know I am, but what are you, right? <laughs> you think about what, you, what we do when we learn that as young children, how we're, we go after people and we, the, we want to retaliate. We want to reciprocate bad behavior. And so it all goes against, that's just where we are drawn to. So one of the things that, that I felt when I was praying through this passage of scripture, something for us to take away, thinking about this idea of loving when it's hard, it's, it will not be easy. It just won't. There's, there's no secret recipe to getting along with people who are hard to get along with. Sometimes in some relationships, you're just oil and water. It just doesn't mix at all. But yet we are called to love. We are called to build in relationship, but it's not going to be easy. Here's what's easy. And we've kind of laid this foundation. But you think about when we, we, retaliation is easy. Positively and negatively. Reciprocal relationships is easy. Whether if somebody says something to hurt you, well, immediately you're gonna turn back and say something to hurt them. That's the easy response. Or when somebody does something good for you. So there's somebody I know is having a birthday soon. And so, you know, you think about the people and individually with birthdays, right? And you think about, you know, man, they, were, they got me this great gift for my birthday. You know, I really wanna do something special for them on their birthday. You've said that before, right? You've also said this, that joker didn't get me anything for my birthday. I'm not even gonna text him on his birthday. I'm not even gonna let him know. You've probably done that too, right? So you think about positively or negatively, it's easy to respond. Or you say, you know what, man, that guy's always doing things for people. I wanna make sure we do something nice for him. And what's Jesus saying about that reciprocal relationship? He's like, man, that's easy. That's a layup. That is something that we can all accomplish. Even sinners are doing that, but I am calling you to something different. I'm calling you to something bigger and something better. When you think about what is holiness, it's being set apart. It is being distinguishably different from everything else. That in our relationships, our relationships need to look different. They cannot look the same. And so when our relationships, it's easy to do good to those who are doing good to you. It is easy to to, to be able to to lend to people that you know you're gonna get money back from. That's easy. That's a good investment. That's common sense. But what's not common sense, what isn't easy, is knowing somebody that you've lent money to in the past, you've never gotten it back, and they're coming to you again and saying, hey, can I borrow a little bit of money? And you're like, yeah, I'm never gonna see that again. And the natural response is to what? Say, get out of here, man. I, you still owe me a hundred bucks. But the reality is when we think about it, it's not going to be easy when we are called to, to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, and to pray for those who abuse us. There's no way, shape, or form this is going to be something that is easy. But you've always heard the statement said, if it's easy, it ain't worth doing. And the gospel is an easy message, but It takes the spirit of God to move in us to live it out. And that is why Jesus came. And when he said, it is better for me to go that the spirit of God would come to lead and guide us and to control us into all truth and understanding and to live for him. But very simply, it will not be easy. The next thing, don't expect it to always make sense. And now these seem very simple but yet I hope very practical for us to think about in our relationships that don't expect it to always make sense. Because when you think about it, why, why would you do that for that person? They hate you. Why would you go above and beyond for them when they don't even care about you? Why, why, why do you speak so kind of this person when I heard them the other day talking bad about you behind your back? Why, why would you do this? Why? People can't understand. But what it does is it allows them to see the gospel in a way that we pray would draw them to the truth of Jesus Christ. But it's not going to make sense. You think about the money lending piece, right? 
So where Jesus here is saying, give to everyone who begs, everyone. Now we think about that. Jesus is giving an overstatement here. He's, what he's challenging us to do is to counter against the flesh and what it is. So you think about this and, and I'm gonna throw myself under the bus. And if y'all, y'all just gonna let me hang out here, that's fine, but I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. But you think about when you go to the stop signs or the stoplights and you see the person on the side of the road that's holding up the, 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 the sign, right? Need help, we'll work for food. You can't tell me that there hasn't been a day where you thought about, well, you've been sitting here for four hours, you could go push a cash register at McDonald's and collect a paycheck, right? And you drive off and you feel justified. Y'all look at me like I'm heartless. <laughs> but what we do, but here, here, here's where we come from, right? What does Paul say to, the, to people in Thessalonica? He says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now that gratifies my flesh. That helps me understand that to me is justice. Work and you can eat. If you don't wanna work and you wanna be lazy, you get nothing, right? But what we have to understand is the fact that he's challenging us here, but Jesus is saying something else over here. So where do we, where's the balance? It's the discernment and being led by the Spirit to be able to, to give extravagantly, lovingly, unconditionally to other people. And so there's gonna be times where we're commanded to give and to love extravagantly. But yes, there are times that we are not to give, that we are to allow people to want to work and to desire after their own provision in their own ways. But most of the time, it's not going to make sense. It is just not, there's sometimes common sense just is disrupted when it comes to the gospel. No, I shouldn't lend them money, but I love them and I'm going to anyway and I am going to expect nothing in return from them. I am going to be good to them even knowing they are cursing me behind my back. Even though I know that they're gossiping about me because believe it or not, if you gossip, come on people. If they're gossiping with you, you know that when they're telling you about everybody else in y'all's friend group, do not be naive enough to think they ain't talking about you when you're not around. Please don't do that. But challenge people. When people begin to talk about other people, shut it down. And then when, when you want to love people who are still cursing you and doing these things to you, just trust and understand it's not going to make sense internally to you sometimes, but even more so to the people around you. But here's what I love about the Lord. Isaiah 55 my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as, far as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are so much better, so much just more impactful in the sense of being able to love those. If we want to see people stop hating other people, we do good. We bless you know, we give, we love, but we don't do those things in the absence of truth, but we do them in such a powerful and pure way that the truth is undeniable and people are drawn to the light in that way. So the third thing that, I, that I, we can see from this passage of scripture is really we live out the golden rule. I mean, this is something that, that we all believe and, and we all see just as he says in verse 31. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. I don't know about you, but I don't want people to gossip about me. I don't. But I'll probably gossip to other people. Why would I, why would I do that? If I don't want that done to me, why in the world am I doing that? Or you think about when it comes to other people, when you think about your relationships, you know, if, if, if I want somebody to, 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 if I want something from somebody else or something like this, and you begin this journey of manipulation, getting what you want or, or trying to work in these different ways, you see it in children, right? We're, I was talking about this this morning with, with my youngest daughter. She gets everything all the time, most of the time. Her mother says no. But she manipulates to get what she gets what she wants. I didn't teach her that. Her mama did. <laughs> but 
You, she comes, she's not in here. That's why we can talk about her. She's doing childcare. We're good. Y'all don't tell on me now. Don't be gossiping. But when you think about when we go, when we have these, we don't teach our children these things. They figure them out in their own t- intuition, their own nature. They're little sinners, right? But we don't grow out of it. Believe it or not, we just hide it better in how we can manipulate, how we can do these different things. But what we need to always go back to is living out the golden rule. And so in Matthew 7, he says, Matthew writes it this way. He says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. That seems so simple. If you, if you don't want people to, to, to do certain things, stop doing it yourself. Check yourself. Look in the mirror and begin to, to allow God to work in your own life without the expectation of others first. And he says, for this is the law and the prophets. But what is the law and the prophets summed up according to Jesus? He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Again, the gospel message of relationship, of reconciliation, of loving God, loving others, and treating others the way that we want to be treated. You think about even Paul when he talks about the marriage relationships and talks about husbands, treat your wives as you would your own flesh, as you would yourself, as how you want to be treated, treat them. And you think about any relationship that you're in, there's always that relationship. Somebody's got to make the first move. If there's a tension at work in a relationship with somebody there and you kind of avoid each other or you're in competition with each other or, or something's going on there that's, that's off and you find yourself avoiding or doing things, somebody's got to make the move of having a courageous conversation. It's not going to be easy. And if it's you, sometimes that may not even make sense of why it has to be you because maybe they're the cause of the problem. But you do it anyway because it is the golden rule because that is what you would want. I want nothing more. If somebody's got a problem with me, I would much rather that person come to me and have an honest conversation with me so that we can talk through it. Because again, like I said in the beginning with the emojis, it could be just the misunderstanding of is it a high five or are we praying? And once we get to the bottom of the miscommunication, sometimes your relationships can grow from that and get better and improve. And you can see, oh, you know what? That person's not as bad as I thought they were. Because the reality is a lot of our enemies are people that we really just don't even know that well. And we just make assumptions about different people. But we live out the golden rule. And this last thing, this is something that I know that for all of us, it's hard. But we have to trust the Lord to right the wrong. We have to trust God that it is his justice. It is not ours. There are people in your life that you want to see justice served upon. And and you're just being honest, right? If if you're honest with yourselves, I want that person to get what's coming to them, right? You think, you know what, that person's got, I can't stand seeing, you think about David's Psalms, right? God, I don't like the wicked prospering. What in the world is going on? Have vengeance upon them. Take care of it. And I want these things to change. I want these things to take place. I'm sick and tired of seeing all these people succeed around me and they're lying, cheating, and stealing to get it done. And I'm being left over here trying to be obedient. It's not fair. And so when we look at this situation, but we have to trust the Lord to right the wrong. And what does Paul say about this in Romans chapter 12? Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Never. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But even when you stop there before we go into the command of what he leaves us with, Leave it to the wrath of God. Where was the wrath of God poured out? It was poured out on the cross. It was poured out on Jesus. The most radical injustice in the world was the cross of Christ. And God took that on to bring reconciliation. And so when we think about vengeance, we think about God having, having his way 
Well, he took it upon himself and the vengeance was his to take and he took it out on his son so that we could be reconciled to him by his blood so that there could be reconciliation in relationships, so that we could be in right relationship with God through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That doesn't make sense, but it's truth. And it's glorious truth because it is for us to enjoy and to receive. And so when we truly come to the understanding that we have been saved and justified by the work of Christ, It protects us from being built up in pride. It protects us from thinking too highly of ourselves. And we think higher and more exalting of Jesus and his ways and not ours. To where then we can follow in this where he says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. In other words, you will expose them to, to, to the gospel in hopes of bringing judgment or conviction or guilt upon themselves so that they could be drawn to Christ. Because at the end of the day, if our desire and our heart is not for our enemies to be transformed by the power of the gospel, our heart is in the wrong place. When we look at our enemies, when we look at broken relationships in our lives, those broken relationships can only be repaired when the gospel is in the center of it. Because in our flesh, it will never get repaired into the way that God's designed it for us. Do not be overcome by evil. And that is so hard because as we've talked about, when evil happens, what is our response? Fleshly evil in return. We want to overpower evil with more evil. You know, if he's gonna do that to me, oh, you better check this out. This is what I'm about to do to him, right? Right? We want to respond in a way that's just that's count, that's counterproductive to restoring a relationship. And you can either see this in you can see this in, in whether it be with your children, whether it be with, with loved ones, whether it be with your spouse. You know, oftentimes, well, if you treat me this way, I'm gonna do this. And then there, next thing you know, six years later, your your marriage is destroyed because all you've been doing is compounding evil upon evil upon evil. Who's going to make the gospel move in your relationships? Who's going to be willing to say, enough's enough. I'm not gonna overcome your evil with more evil. I'm just going to start doing good. It doesn't make sense. It's not gonna be easy because I've gotten to the point where I just don't like you very much. But it's because of the gospel I do this. Guys, we have to become courageous in our, in our relationships to overcome evil with good. We overcome evil with the message of the gospel. We can overpower the world through goodness, through love of the gospel to other people. But when we think about this, we are going to do good to those who hate us. The people in our community, we are going to do good. We expect nothing in return when we do missions, when we do evangelism, when we do outreach, when we do anything, we expect nothing in return other than the gospel to be preached. When we think about those who curse us, those who wish that we fail, that we're gonna bless them. We are gonna bless them in ways that they just, they get to a place where they feel guilty cursing us because we bless them so much. And we will be on our knees for those who abuse us, those who speak ill of us, those who criticize us, those who tear us down, and heaven forbid, those who have abused you physically, we pray and we pray hard because at the end of the day, it is what the gospel is what restores and saves. And so I pray that when we think about this idea of of loving when it's hard, that we can leave here today just very simply recognizing, look, this is not an easy task. Because I think sometimes that when we come into church and and we hear messages about the word of God, sometimes it's just made to sound so easy. But the reality is our feelings betray us. Our emotions get out ahead of us. When you think about the train, the engine is the will of God and your feelings are the caboose. But how many times do we want the caboose to drive the train? You're not gonna get very far. We have to keep the will of God before us. It's not going to be easy. 
is not going to make sense. But if we stick to the golden rule of loving God and loving others and treating them as we would want to be treated, there will be radical change in the relationships around you. And when you can let go of outcomes and when you can trust that God will have his way, that God will make things right, that you'll be able to let go. And sometimes in some relationships, you'll be able to breathe a sigh of relief and say, I am sick of thinking about this person. I'm sick of thinking about wanting them to, to, to have justice upon their lives. I'm, I'm just let go and let God. Because there are those people that are just, they are exhausting too much mental capacity in your life right now. And it's time for you to let it go. It's time for you to give that over to God. But we need to love when it's hard. And these are the, some things that I, I pray that will, will encourage us and strengthen us. And before I pray, you know, we're gonna come to a time with the Lord's Supper. And I think that that's the most perfect picture of loving when it's hard. As the scripture teaches us, we were enemies of God, separated from him from our sin. But Jesus came, God took on flesh to do what the blood of goats and calves could not do, by living a perfect life, being the perfect sacrifice. So that by the shedding of his blood, our sins could be washed clean. That we could be made righteous in him and be reconciled to God. Being instead of children of wrath, heirs with Christ. But that journey had to come through the cross. God may not be asking us to sacrifice our lives for other people, but he is calling us to make sacrifice. He is calling us to love when it's hard. He is calling us to do things that are counter to, to, to the common sense of the world because he's challenging us to love how he loved. And so when we remember the Lord's Supper, let us allow that to be the picture of how we're to love our enemies and to love those when it's hard to love. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and your truth. God, we thank you for the message of the gospel. That Father, through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to you by the shedding of his blood, Father, and we celebrate that today. God, I just pray for those of us here today that Lord, we have folks in our lives that we need to be reconciled to. That we need to do a better job of loving them well, unconditionally, that God, that it hurts to know that people hate us. It hurts to be cursed. It hurts to be manipulated. It hurts to be taken advantage of. But you called us to rise above. You called us to love anyway. And Father, because that's what you did, that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you still came to the cross and you died for us. That, Father, you saved us, even knowing that even after our faith and trust was placed in you, that we would still fall short and make mistakes throughout our life. But that's how wonderful your mercy and your grace is. And, Father, I just pray that every day that we can just be a little bit more like you for the purpose of making you known to people that are far from you. And I pray, Father, that as we love well, and live well for you, that it would be about building your kingdom. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for our salvation. But Father, I do pray that if there is anyone here today that doesn't know you, Lord, that they haven't put their faith and trust in you, that God, your spirit would draw them to you. Help them to see that there's separation from you because of their sin, but yet through the cross of Christ, they can be healed and set free that all unrighteousness is forgiven through the cross of Christ and that they would come to you by faith. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.